first step, they want to maintain their cultural identity and fully participate in a European welfare state. I claim for theoretical reasons, this doesn't work. That's where I don't believe in multiculturalism. Not in the sense because our culture is uh, higher and so on. My problem is this one, and for this I'm now proclaimed, I don't know, secret fascist right winger. You know, uh, the problem with multiculturalism is that it relies on a certain liberal legalistic dream which simply doesn't work. The idea is each community can maintain, if it wants, of course, it can also mix with others, its own way of life. The state just has to guarantee the, how should I call it, peaceful coexistence without violence and so on. I claim this absolutely doesn't and cannot work for the simple reason that every cultural identity is never just about yourself, of ourselves. It involves the notion of how you relate to others, plus there is another mega problem. Every culture has its own inherent antagonisms, conflicts, and so on. For example, my good friend Udi Aloni, who is sometimes even more crazy than you or me, which is quite an achievement then, he told me a wonderful story. There is a Palestinian uh, rapper, I forgot his name, I'm sorry, who recently visited the United States and about a year ago, I think, he gave a concert at UCLA. And you know what happened there? After the, and one of his songs was against honor killings. He also protests, of course, Zionist oppression, blah, blah. But he, and he was immediately attacked there by some fanatical anti-Zionist, but wrong ones, I think, that why do you mention this? Don't you know that this serves the, the, serves the purposes of Zionism and so on? basically they accused him of being a Zionist a spy, slave, or whatever. And he gave a wonderful, dignified answer to this, of course, wealthy student. He said that the difference between you and me is that you study in one of the richest universities in the world, and you talk in this way to guarantee your career, to become popular with your wealthy, wealthy pseudo-radical professors, in English, while I, in my country, sing in Hebrew and Arab to help women who really suffer there. And so you see this hypocrisy. In, instead of being glad, we don't have to patronize the Palestinians. We just have to join their own struggle. And they are not so marginal. There, it's a whole still minority, but a very strong movement on the West Bank, which says, okay, okay, anti-Zionist struggle, but at the same time, my God, we have many problems of our own, like honor killings and so on. And to give you an example, they are even have wonderful sense of humor. They absolutely don't fit this ridiculous idea of, you know, fanatical Palestinians. Like, I'm sure if you know this story, it's not a dirty one. It's a wonderful one. It's based on that mistranslation. Every good, so I was told, uh, scientist who, a historian of Koran, knows that, you know, that stupid idea. If you are a martyr and go to heaven, you get 70 virgins and so on. Everybody knows that this is a translation mistake. The term used in Koran designates the top quality white grape raisins. And the expression, you will get 70, it's not virgins. This was at that time, 6th, 7th century, the standard phrase for hospitality. It means I give you a whole feast of raisins, it means you are a welcome guest. And Palestinians told me this wonderful joke. There is an ugly Palestinian guy who wants to screw girls, he's ugly, no girl wants him. So he says, my God, I will become a martyr, I kill myself, I go up and I will get it there. Okay, he does it, he awakens in paradise and gets the raisins. 
And then he says, sorry, translation, mistake, translation, can I go back, please? It was all a linguistic misunderstanding. <laughs> so, you know what I'm saying here? This is the, you, like, you, I hate all those liberal, centrist, uh, atheists, which are now fashionable in the United States. Let's name them. Name them. Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, and so on. You know why? First, they are not really neutral. I strategically agree with them when they criticize some type of radical left for you are allowed to mock everyone except Islam. Like, we should be tender there. You are immediately accused of Islamophobia. I agree with this. I absolutely think we should be ruthless also towards Islam. But the problem I have is that then let's be ruthless towards everyone. You know my problem with, you remember that Charlie Hebdo murders, you know. I always explode when I hear the story, oh my God, how open we are in Europe. You see, it's our spirit that you can make fun of everything. Those stupid Arab things, uh, some topics, Muslims are out, unmentionable, but it's not like this, and I think it's even good that it's not like this. Every culture has its, how should I call it, unmentionable points. Like, okay, in Europe you can make fun of Mohammed, but can you make fun of Holocaust? Try to do this, and you will see how you will also be immediately excommunicated. Now, wait a minute. My point is not, so let's allow this also. My point is simply that to prohibit some things, ethically, is not in itself a bad thing. Now, to provoke you, I will say it's even a sign of progress. I'm from progressive dogmaticism. Maybe you know the story. I will repeat it. Would you really like to live in a society where you would have to argue, like Habermasian's rational argumentation, why women should not be ra raped, you know? No, I would like to live in a society where this is, in a good sense, simply accepted as a self-evidence. So when some guy starts to deploy this tasteless line, you know, ooh, but don't you see she secretly enjoyed it and so on, you don't have to argue. The guy simply immediately appears as an idiot. You know, in this sense, I claim the first thing to accept is that, of course, it's not the same. I'm not saying our taboos are the same as their taboos. I'm just saying the first clear point. Every culture has its taboos. Don't have any illusions here. At certain level, we are more tolerant, but things are much more ambiguous. Let me tell you a story. This time, I think I don't repeat myself, at least not here. I used this yesterday in Brown Providence, but not here. Uh, you remember when some three, four years ago, when he was still president, Ahmadinejad, while he was at UN, visited Colombia, and there was a big public debate there. Now, I don't know if this is true, but I spoke with two Iranian friends of mine who told me something very interesting. What? They were there, and they told me, and again, they were not friends, no friends of Ahmadinejad. My God, they were emigrants escaping Islamic revolution. But they said, that the translation was totally misleading, namely, as you could have expected, some guy provocatively asked Ahmadinejad, how about homosexuals? How do you deal with them in Iran? And Ahmadinejad's reply was translated as, we don't have these problems, there are no homosexuals in Iran. Then, of course, everyone laughed and so on. Eh, but my friend told me, no, he gave effectively a much more refined answer. Something like, we deal with this in a totally different way than you. We don't talk about it and allow you to do it discreetly. And my friend told me that, that basically the implicit reference, because Ahmadinejad was an idiot, but he knew, you know, for them it's also the sacred book, the Old Testament. 